Good evening. Welcome to St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict. Uh, my name is Michael Hemesath, and I'm the president of St. John's University. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's 26th annual Peace Studies conference and lecture. Earlier this evening, we had the privilege of posthumously awarding the Coleman J. Berry Award for distinguished contributions to religion and society to Matthew Amon, a St. John's Prep class of 1949 member and a graduate of St. John's University in the class of 1952. We honored Matthew for his leadership in the Civil Rights Movement, some of which you just learned about on the video, and for his lifelong commitment to social justice. Margaret Amon, his wife of 47 years, accepted the award on his behalf along with three of her children and other family members. If I could embarrass Margaret and her family members to please stand and let the audience see the number of the Amon and Hall family members who came and joined us this evening. Please. The whole extended family, please. Clearly a legacy that has extended through the generations. Thank you for joining us. I would also like to recognize the presence of many of Matthew's prep and university classmates. Uh, if I could, again, prevail upon you to stand and let the audience see that his prep and uh, university classmates are here to help honor him as well. If I could get you to do that once more this evening. Prep and university classmates. I also want to note a number of other people that made this event possible. These kinds of events, of course, do not happen without tremendous support from our alums and with tremendous hard work by folks on campus. So we're particularly grateful to Donald Hall, a member of the St. John's Prep Class of 1955 and the St. John's University Class of 1959 and a first cousin of Matthew. Uh, the Peace Studies Department, of course, was integral for putting on this event. Uh, the University Chair in Critical Thinking was a co-sponsor and the Eugene McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement at St. John's were also part of sponsoring this event. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I will now uh, introduce you to Kelly Kramer, the chair of the Peace Studies Department. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for being here. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the presence uh, tonight of Joan Trumpauer Mulholland, would you please stand? Uh, she earlier today really amazed us, uh, sharing <laughs> sharing the story of her courageous work as a Southern white woman in the Civil Rights Movement, which just from that fact could have gotten her killed, and we're very grateful to have you here tonight. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the patronage of Robert and Lorraine Breitenbucher, who have generously funded our Peace Studies Conference every year for more than a quarter of a century. Um, I want to thank Professor Jeff Anderson, who was the major organizer for our conference this year, and Sheila Hellerman, Peace Studies Department Coordinator Extraordinaire, who would prefer to go unnoticed, uh, but whose tireless attention to detail made all of today's events possible. And now I'm pleased to introduce you to Yasin Williams, who will introduce our program for the evening. Yasin is a junior pre-law student majoring in history and minoring in philosophy. Uh, he hails from New Jersey, where he graduated from St. Benedict's Preparatory School. He's a Healy Scholar, an Intercultural Lead Fellow, and the founder of the Illmatic Force Dance Group here on campus. <laughs> Uh, yes, I sound very white when I say it, I admit it. <laughs> uh, he's planning a career as a corporate lawyer and hopes one day to serve on the Supreme Court. Good evening and welcome. I am so pleased to be here with you all tonight and to have this opportunity of introducing a man who is known today as a civil rights icon, a man known to be an eminent authority on nonviolent social change, a man known as Dr. Bernard Lafayette. First, I would like to share with you all 
a few words about Gary Eichten, St. John's alum from 1969, who is also here with us tonight to engage Dr. Lafayette in a conversation designed to do nothing less than draw out his experiences of nonviolence and inter interracial justice. Many Minnesotans here tonight will recognize the voice of Gary from Minnesota Public Radio. Before his retirement in 2012, he spent 45 years there serving under many different titles. He is a master interviewer and has won numerous broadcasting awards. Now I would like to remind you all the reason we are gathered here. We come together tonight to pay respect to an honorable man whose history speaks volumes. Originally from Tampa, Florida, Dr. Lafayette, at the age of 20, started his career in the civil rights movement while he was a student in Nashville, Tennessee in 1960. This also marks the year the non Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded with Dr. Lafayette as one of its co-founders. As a SNCC activist and student leader, Dr. Lafayette participated in many sit-ins and freedom rides in order to test and challenge segregated facilities. It is important to note that by no means was Dr. Lafayette just another person who participated in these sit-ins and freedom rides. His role was just as important as any other leader of the campaign. In fact, after the group of freedom riders had been divided in half, it was Dr. Lafayette's duty to bring the second group of student freedom riders to Birmingham, Alabama, if for whatever reason, the first group couldn't continue. This wasn't his only position. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. appointed Dr. Lafayette as the National Program Administrator for the Student Christian Leadership Conference and the National Coordinator of 1968 Poor People's Campaign. Dr. Bernard Lafayette remains active today. He's a distinguished senior scholar in residence at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and travels around the world and around the country conducting nonviolent workshops. Now let me say, uh, now let me say something about my own reaction to this. I cannot help but to think that if it were not for leaders for like Dr. Lafayette, I would not, as a black man, have had some of the opportunities I have now, like standing before you all today. Additionally, I would not have attended a predominantly white college, presuming I would have attended a college at all, because institutional racism and segregation would have still been prevalent in this country. I guess what I'm trying to say is, Dr. Lafayette has certainly made things easier for me as a black man in this country. Therefore, I'm grateful and most appreciative to have him here with us tonight. I consider it an honor, and I'm proud to present a man of such exceptional caliber. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bernard Lafayette. Thank you. Dr. Lafayette, a real honor to be sharing a stage with uh, one of the civil rights giants in America. It's a, it's a true honor. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, you know, we were paying special tribute to uh, Joan Trumpower Mulholland and Matthew Amon. Struck me that uh, we've got a, a white man from St. Cloud, a white woman from the South. Uh, a good reminder, don't you think, that the civil rights movement was really much broader than we usually think of it, uh, that this was not just a handful of black activists. This was a very broad movement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Got to ask you, how in the world did you muster the courage to step forward, knowing that you were almost certainly going to get beaten up along the way and could very well have died? Well, actually, I had really anticipated uh, death at an earlier period in my life because I used to uh, visit the cemetery a lot. And the reason I visit the cemetery is because I was afraid. And I didn't like myself being afraid. I was very thin. Some of you didn't recognize me in some of the other film footage, the Freedom Rides. Still quite <laughs> spelt, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, actually, see, people don't realize in the sit-in movement, we sat at the lunch counter, but we didn't get any food. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot really count the number of meals that I missed. <laughs> but I try to make up for them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So being a little skinny fella from Tampa, Florida, who was afraid to wear short pants because they thought maybe my legs was a string hanging down, you know. <laughs> so uh, I used to get bullied, all right? And it was just embarrassing to be scared. I didn't like it. Even when I was smaller, I used to be scared of the ghost. You know, that was my greatest fear, those ghosts. And particularly since I um, thought they slept under my bed at night. So I was afraid to go to sleep, you know, because mm -hmm. those ghosts might come. It was just a terrible little thing as growing up. So the way I fought fear was to go through and walk through the graveyard at night. Did it work? Well, until that cat jumped out the tree. <laughs> I had to start all over again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so on a serious note, one of the most paralyzing experiences that a young person could have is to be paralyzed with fear. So the question is, how do we gain courage? I was also afraid of death when I was little. But I knew I was not going to live forever here. And I didn't know when I was going to die. None of us actually do. But I had to overcome the fear of death. So when I read Martin Luther King and heard his speeches and how he talked about the fact that we have to give our lives. A and if you decide to give your life to something that's worthwhile, you're not afraid to die because no one can take your life if you give it. They come after you to try to take your life. You can say, I'm sorry, I've already given it. Hmm. <laughs> it's too late. Were, so, you, were you surprised, though, at the level of violence that you encountered? Uh, wasn't just a few handful of people, who, you know, thugs. Pretty widespread and pretty nasty, really nasty. Yes, I had to come to recognize that there was a significant number of people who were hateful towards others. And the question is, why were they so hateful towards others? It's not important to uh, be angry with someone who you don't like or you don't like their behavior. The most important thing is to understand why. So that put me into a serious mode of study. And I had to understand why the people, uh, specifically the white people in the South, were so hateful towards black people. And as I continued to study, what I discovered is that, um, first of all, uh, the history of the relationship as slaves you know that white folks did not believe that black people had souls. So if someone doesn't believe you have a soul, that means that you're not fully human. So therefore, to even imagine talking about equality with some being that you have soul in slavery, like you do cattle and horses, and that's what blacks... This is the hardest thing for people to recognize, that black folks were actually sold like horses and animals. Yes. A and some were sold in order to reproduce others. Those Mandingo from the tribe, they used to have five and six women, okay, expecting at the same time. Because that's why they bought them for reproduction purposes. They were slaves. Now, to think that that 
animal that you just sold is going to be equal to you, okay? And this is the mindset. So you have to understand, well, even today, <laughs> I mean, there are people who do not believe that, uh, you know, the president of the United States was actually, you know, has a birth certificate in the U.S. And that's, a, you know, obsession with them. Logic? No, we're not talking about logic. We're talking about emotional, okay, distortion. They feel it. It's not rational. They feel it. So my point is, I understand why uh, white people behave the way they do. That's important for you to understand. So therefore, if you understand why they feel the way they do, you can begin to look at what does it take for them to change. Oh, by the way, uh, some people don't notice this, but if you remember now, in the movies, in the marches and demonstrations and freedom rides, remember those people all dressed up with suits and ties? It's not the way you ride the bus. <laughs> it's not how you go down and get a hamburger with a suit and tie on. You know what that was all about? That was about trying to jog their conscience. So they had to make a choice between sitting down next to the people who attacked us or sitting down next to someone with a suit and tie on. So we deliberately were working at trying to change their perception of us. Now, uh, Alabama, then Alabama Governor John Patterson said, uh, charged that the primary goal of the Freedom Riders and other direct actions was to provoke a violent reaction, which in turn would elicit sympathy for the civil rights movement. True? No. No, we were not doing this to provoke the other folk. We were giving them a new perception, okay, of us as human beings. That's why we were nonviolent because we wanted to win them over. You cannot make change in a nonviolent process if your goal is to defeat your opponent. Our goal was to win the opponents over. We were certainly aware that there were some people in the North and other places, okay, in the U.S., who were totally unaware of the kind of conditions that exist in the South by those of us who uh, were involved in the movement, by taking action, you see, our actions were very much related to the goal. We wanted to eat at the lunch counter, so therefore we went and we sat at the lunch counters. Mm -hmm. Okay, we didn't go pick at the Capitol. <laughs> All right? So my point is, once people recognize that we were not able to be treated equally at the lunch counter in public facilities. We're not talking about the country club. We're talking about equal facilities for the public accommodations. And they felt this was un-American. Now, the, the point here I want to make is that no revolution, whether it's violent or nonviolent, can be won without winning the sympathy, if not the active support, of the majority. Guess what? Those Supreme Court decisions that were made, like in 54, no blacks on that Supreme Court. The Civil Rights Bill that was passed in, 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 in 64, coming out of the Birmingham movement, that's why we had to march on Washington, to give the whites a chance to show their support for the public accommodation bill. So there was a strategy involved. And whites came through. Mm -hmm. So then we have to recognize that that was white power. Okay? And that's why the change came, because of the white power. They stepped forward and stepped out. Okay? All right? All right? Like Armand. Okay? took a stand, mm -hmm. and, and not just by himself. He went and mobilized other folk. My point, if that had not happened, we would not have been able to get the, the bill through. But it's the presence of all of those people, all right? And what they were saying was, 
listening to Martin Luther King, he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I'm proud of America. I, lo I love America. I'm proud of it. And that's why I believe that, you know, we still can change uh, because the, the, the heart is there. Now we have some pockets of people who, and I can talk about that later, how we make that change, but the majority of the people in this country, mm -hmm, yeah, all those bills that were passed, the voters' rights bill, all that sort of stuff, the majority of people who passed the bill were in Congress, and the majority of the Congress people were white. Now, you know, looking back on, on the the developments, looking back at the 50s, 60s, and so on, you get a sense of inevitability, and I think that's true of pretty much every historical thing. Well, sure, that's the way it was going to turn out. Did you have that sense? That, was there ever a time when you thought, you know, we may not succeed here? No. I didn't know how long it would take, but I had the confidence that if we stayed on track, okay, yeah. it's like the the six principles of nonviolence that God and Martin Luther King taught. The universe is on the side of justice. May not come when we want it, mm -hmm. okay? But it will come on time. So I never had any hesitation. And that's why I was willing to give my life. Because I believed that in the results, in the final analysis, the change would come. I wanted to ask you about a couple of anniversaries. 50th anniversaries. First of all, we just got done marking the 50th anniversary of the famous March on Washington, the I Have a Dream event. Did you, uh, were you are you surprised at just how uh, much impact that event has had on American history? Well, yes, I am surprised. Okay, because that was 50 years ago when we were organizing and planning for that march, we did not know how many people were going to show up. There were national leaders who were discouraging Martin Luther King, okay, about uh, carrying forth with that march. They said, in effect, and I can quote them, that if you bring all of these angry black people to Washington, D.C., and they start a riot, you're going to set civil rights back 50 years. That's what they thought was going to happen in 50 years, okay? Mm -hmm. There was going to be a setback for 50 years. But Martin Luther King and I joined him in having faith that this is something we needed to do, and we had to take the risk. We were hoping nothing terrible would happen like a riot, but we could not uh, actually control everything, because a lot of people don't know, though, but the labor union, they were with us, and the labor union provided the marshals for us. One of the things you must always remember, when you have a march, you got to have trained marshals, mm -hmm. and that did help. Another uh, anniversary, 50th anniversary, comes up next month, the 50th anniversary of the uh, assassination of uh, President John F. Kennedy. Uh, was he, what, w what was the Kennedy's position on civil rights? Were they supportive? Uh, did they, were they willing to take risks? Or did they have to be pushed and shoved? Well, uh, each administration has its uh, agenda. Okay? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, President Johnson with the war on poverty and that sort of thing. Uh, each president wants to make his mark. No child left behind. There's always a theme or an issue attached to, okay, the administrations. Mm -hmm. Like Obama, they call it Obamacare, okay? If you didn't know it was health, you wouldn't know what it was, okay? <laughs> 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 but uh, yes, so the Kennedys, for example. Kennedy wanted to make a strong statement in terms of uh, democracy, our democracy, our practice of democracy as a model. 
that's why, you know, you know, the uh, bear pigs, okay, all that sort of thing, uh, the uh, kind of things that he was uh, uh, supporting in terms of even the, uh, the war. Uh, so my point is he was fighting communism, and he was trying to show. So his, his mark was going to be international. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So these demonstrations and protests and people getting beaten up and put in jail, uh, you know, if you didn't have all of that international press, all right, it wouldn't have been such a problem. But hey, he was trying to show people about how we have a democratic country and our form of government is the one that's the model. And then you have all of this demonstration and people beating up each other, burning buses and folks sitting in and getting water holes and all that. Uh, he wanted that to get, you know, kind of settled. Mm -hmm. All right, quickly, out of the news. So that was his initial motivation. But when he realized that this was not going to go away, then he had to stop and he had to address it, okay? Because it was not going away. So uh, I think that uh, he became uh, supportive as a, a means of being able to address these issues so that he could be able to go on and complete his agenda, okay? Now, having said that, it was, it was Senator Kennedy running for president who made a phone call to Reedsville jail judge that got Martin Luther King out of jail. Because Martin Luther King was in jail because he had not changed his driver's license, okay, when he moved from Alabama to Georgia. That's why he was in jail, all right? And... Uh, it was uh, Woodruff, I believe, who, uh, walk, I'm trying to think of his name, is uh, the historian who was working with Kennedy, and he told Kennedy to uh, call Martin Luther King's wife and express his concern. And he did. And Mrs. King, Coretta Scott King, at the end of the conversation, uh, Kennedy said, now if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. And she is being from, uh, you know, sound very literal. And she said, yes, get my husband out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> so he made, <laughs> he made a phone call to the judge. And that actually started the whole process, uh, got Martin Luther King out on probation. And I want to make a point here. In the Freedom Rides film, there are some comments about Martin Luther King not joining the Freedom Rides. Mm -hmm. and I think Julian so Bond is quoted as saying, well, it proves that he had feet of clay. Yes. I wanted to uh, correct that. There are two points. One is, had Martin Luther King got arrested on the Freedom Rides, he would not have gone to Parchman. He would have gone back to Reedsville for violation of his probation which had nothing to do with social change movement. They were going to jail to desegregate the buses, but Martin Luther King would have gone to jail because of the driver's license. You have to be logical. And when you don't have information, sometimes you do make statements like that. There's another point, feats of clay. Martin Luther King, I saw him at the mass meeting in Montgomery on stage when he called for, okay, if you see the real rest of the film, he said, I, I'm, I have a very special mission and I want to get people who are sure about their nonviolence. He said this in church. And only a few people volunteered who were sure about their nonviolence. He walked out because I was standing on the steps in front of the church. He walked out through a mob the, you saw the violence, you saw the film footage of the cars being turned over and, and, and rocks being thrown through the church uh, uh, glass windows and all that sort of thing. Martin Luther King walked out there with about 12 others. You were trapped in the church, too. Yes, absolutely. I was in that church. And when he walked out the back of that church, I was standing on the steps, and I saw him walk through that mob. And I said to myself, that's the last time we're going to see Martin Luther King. 
You know what he did? He went because he heard there were some cab drivers, black cab drivers at a service station, and they were organizing and getting their guns together to come and rescue us out of church. Martin Luther King went there and talked to them, persuaded them to put their guns down. That would have been a, a mob action. And by the way, those cab drivers, they were from World War II. Okay? All right? They knew, okay, how to fight. They didn't just go around sticking up people like they did in Chicago. Okay? They could shoot. All right? And Martin Luther King dissuaded them. But then the miracle is he walked back through that mob. I was standing there. I saw him. Now, is that somebody who got clay feet? Well, <laughs> well, what about Martin Luther King? Now, we, you know, we have a good sense of him, I think, as a, as a public person, as a symbol. What was he like as a person? Well, I love to talk about that because that's something that people would never know unless they were around him. Number one, Martin Luther King was uh, a rival, okay, to Dick Gregory in terms of humor. He used to tell the best jokes, okay? <laughs> Martin Luther King was just fun to be around, telling jokes. In fact, it was Martin Luther King's job to keep the driver awake. We used to have to travel late at night going from one rural city to another. His job was to sit in the front seat and keep the driver laughing so he wouldn't go to sleep. Do kind of a stand-up routine. Yes, uh, sit out either. <laughs> he was used to do that. And then he was a great shoe, uh, a, a pool shark. Really? Yeah. You see, that, uh, that uh, <laughs> seminary you went to up there, Crozer, uh, in the basement of the chapel, they had a pool table. And that's what the guys used to do on the weekends, you know. So Martin Luther King got to be really good at shooting pool. And we used to go to different cities, those rural areas, and head straight to the pool hall. Yeah, and say, well, bring your best shot out. And they go wake him up somewhere, you know. <laughs> and then he was so nervous that he was shooting pool with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King used to clean the table off while he was shooting. <laughs> April uh, 1968, you're in Memphis, the Lorraine Motel, with Martin Luther King. What was that like? Of course, the <laughs> Martin Luther King was assassinated that day. Yeah. What happened was he was having a staff meeting, executive staff meeting in Atlanta. He got this call to come to Memphis because the sanitation workers were on strike and they were marching and their, their movement was waning and uh, they wanted Martin Luther King to come and give a sort of a shot in the arm and stimulate them and have a press conference and march with them. Well, he didn't want to go to Memphis, by the way, because it was off schedule. We were having a staff meeting planning the Poor People's Campaign. Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, Jose Williams, Jim Bevel, Dorothy Cotton, go right down the line, okay? T.Y. Rogers. So um, he said, you guys go ahead and stay here in Atlanta I'm just going to go up to Memphis one day and come back. And the guy who traveled with him was Bernard Lee. And, uh, well, when they got up there and had to march, it broke up in violence. So we decided since we had to do the march over again, we would just go to Memphis. Mm -hmm. That's why all of us were in Memphis. And so what happened is that uh, while we were planning to have the march over again, Martin Luther King was scheduled to be in Washington, D.C., for a press conference at 14th and U to open up the campaign headquarters for the Poor People's Campaign. And since I was the national coordinator for the Poor People's Campaign, Martin Luther King appointed me to that position, uh, I went to represent him. So I was working on a press statement that I would read the night before, but they had the mass meeting and Martin Luther King went to that. So the next morning, April 4th, here we are in room 306, Memphis, Tennessee, at the Lorraine Hotel. My room was 206 downstairs. And uh, Martin Luther King was uh, tweaking the press statement that morning. When he finished the press statement, he turned to me and he made this statement, which had nothing to do with the press statement. It's non sequitur. He said, Bernard, 
the next movement we're going to have is to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence, comma, to be discussed later. Mm -hmm. I caught the plane five hours later as I landed into uh, uh, Washington, D.C. National Airport at that time. I learned that Martin Luther King had been shot. I called UPI, United Press International, and I called AP because I knew those two could give me, you know, the update, quick information, reading from the ticker tapes. And um, there was a reporter there who knew who I was uh, from UPI, and he was reading it to me. And then he broke down in tears. This white man broke down in tears, the reporter on the other end of the line. So I knew what was happening. And he squeaked out, you know, his voice to tell me that Martin Luther King was dead. That's how I found out that Martin Luther King had died. I haven't cried because I haven't had time to grieve. I had to work on getting nonviolence institutionalized and internationalized. So we got about 36 centers around the world where we're teaching King in nonviolence in prisons and uh, in communities, colleges, universities, nonprofits. And that's why I'm so glad to be here to see the work that you're doing here at St. John's. You are fulfilling Martin Luther King's last request. Should we think about the election of Barack Obama as president as kind of the culmination of the civil rights movement, the end of the struggle? Uh, it's a giant step along the way. In that Freedom Ride film, you can see where Robert Kennedy, Attorney General, okay, back in the early 60s, saying that uh, we may see in our generation uh, a Negro president. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's just one step along the way. Now, since we have this opportunity, let's just be clear about it, okay? Barack Obama was not expected to win the first election. Okay? Unfortunately, some of my civil rights friends did not support him in the primary. Because mm -hmm. they didn't think that was going to be possible for this young, you know, guy from Chicago, s senator and all that business. But, uh, you know, they didn't expect that to happen. It happened. The question is, how did it happen? Well, it happened because a large number of people who had never voted before, okay, decided they were going to get up and go get registered to vote. And a large percentage of those people were older white women in the Midwest, okay? Some of them were, okay, seniors, not just senior citizens, okay, but in their 80s and even 90s, had never voted before. But they went out and voted mm -hmm. for the first time. People told me about their relatives, okay? All right. So the point I'm making is that he was able to stimulate people and get them moving, all right? Because even in his message, he said he wanted to be the president of all the people, okay? So he wanted to be the president of, 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 of the poor people, and he wanted to be the president of the middle class people and, and, and all the rest of them. He didn't really campaign as a Democrat. He wanted to be president of Republicans, so, you know, he was serious, you know. He wanted to be president of Republicans, see, uh, which was, uh, you know, what a president should be. He did not run on a black platform like the previous black candidates. See, the previous black candidates mm -hmm. ran on a black platform so the black people would have a voice in the national government. Mm -hmm. He didn't want the voice. He wanted the presidency. What do you see, uh, Dr. Lafayette, what do you see as some of the, big, the biggest challenges facing us today? Okay. 
there are three big challenges. There are many others, but just the three big, the biggest one. Number one, we have to overcome the idea that we are only Americans. We were born on earth. That's where we were born. This geographical design, you know, and all that uh, maps and stuff like that and trying to get your identity. What is an immigrant? <laughs> Think about it. I, well, how do you get to be an immigrant? All right? No, you just showed up. You were born on the earth. That's right. Yeah. Middle East is a direction. It's not a <laughs> We have to overcome that. Our identity is the biggest problem that limits us in our thinking. Trade. You're going to be trading with those people over. And who do you think those people are anyway? Huh? Yeah, they were born just like you were born on earth, and they're going to leave just like you're going to leave on earth. <laughs> now, some of you already know this, that there's a campaign to recruit 80,000 people to go to Mars. But they are not going to have graveyards in Mars. They're going to send you back. To earth, okay? Now that's the biggest problem, identity. We're all mixed up on how much, who's white and who's black and who's, you know, all these people. When you get them to start talking, you know what you find out? Man, they got some Native American in their background. They got some of this in their background and everything. Nobody claims Africa. But the, 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 the original people, that's where they're from. All the research shows that. So we're all Africans, if you want to make the, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's the biggest problem. <laughs> now, the next problem is this. I'm, I'm doing the deductive approach now. So that's the larger issue. The more narrow issue is that if we are going to have a government for the people, it has to be by the people. And if folks don't vote and don't participate in government, it's not just even voting. You've got to go and have meetings with the folks who are supposed to represent you. The only thing those people uh, elected, by the way, and they're showing you that, by the way, the people that, that, that elected officials, the only decision they make are decisions about money. And whose money you think it is? Yeah, right. So my point is, if we don't uh, go and participate in government, it's not going to be by the people. It's going to be for the people. You know the for. You know what people is going to be for, huh? <laughs> you know, those are people I'm talking about. That's for the people, not by the people. <laughs> so my my point is, we have got to have participation in government. One of the things that every college ought to do, and I'm saying this because I'm on a college campus is to make sure that every student is registered to vote. I'm not going to ask somebody to raise their hand who's 18 and have them registered. I wouldn't do that to St. John's. Why? <laughs> 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 I, I think I said it already. <laughs> yeah, that's the first thing you need to do, uh, is go get yourself registered to vote, mm -hmm. find out who's, uh, particip who, who's supposed to be representing you, okay? So you can organize a meeting to go meet with the folks who are supposed to be representing you. That's what the Poor People's Campaign was about, going to Congress to meet with the congressmen and putting a face on poverty. All they were doing is looking at statistics. The Poor, poor People's Campaign was to bring the poor people with their mules, okay? The mules even got a chance to go to Washington, okay? And to speak to the congressmen. That's the, that's the second point, all right? that we have got to have a voice in government, so we got to make our voices heard, but that we also got to make our faces seen. We got to show up. That's what that Washington thing was all about, showing up. Show your face, okay? Now, the third thing 
is that there is no reason why we should have the level of poverty in this country with all of the food. In fact, some people don't know this. They pay farmers not to grow food here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why are folks hungry? Okay? Well, not because you can't grow food. Yeah. Okay? The Jolly Green Giant down the road there. We know that. So my point is, we have got to have our young people now focused on making sure that your sisters and brothers, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about no foreigners. Ain't nobody no foreign, okay? Your sisters and brothers, all of us. And we look at all those folks who got different color skin and different uh, kind of hair and, and different all that kind of stuff. And even those who have earrings in their ear and other places. I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know about that. I, I, I know. Yeah. All right. So they're trying to make a statement about their identity. That's what that's all about. We've got to embrace everybody. Okay. And love them. Because we ain't got that much. We ain't don't have time to hate. Now, the next thing is this. And I'll wait for the next question. This whole idea, all right, of the rise of the, uh, uh, you might say, racism. Why do you think these folks are acting the way they're acting? They weren't victims of any discrimination, white folks, okay? And these young people, they didn't know about those days of segregation and all that, and they're all over the place. Some riding on motorcycles and stuff. But my point is, uh, why are they acting like that? We thought we had solved all these problems of the past. All right? No. What we didn't account for is the third generation syndrome. Third generation. The first generation that comes over, all right, they bring their culture, they bring their religion, they bring their clothes, they bring their food. Food is good. And... Uh, my point is, they bring everything from the, their own other countries and their cultures, all right? The second generation, all right, start eating McDonald's, all right? They change their clothes. They want to assimilate. They want to be part of, you know, the dominant culture in their minds, the dominant culture. Might not be numbers, but dominant. Like how you talk about majority and minority. It's power. Okay? Like in South Africa. Okay? Majority power were, okay, the Afrikaans. So, the point we're making is that people want to assimilate and be just sort of blend in and be a part. The third generation, they want to go back and look at what their grandparents, uh, great-grandparents, whatever length of time that creates the third generation, all right? So you remember the blacks start putting on dashikis and start napping up their hair? I had a huge afro. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't recognize me back then, <laughs> okay? Yeah, huge afro, all right? That kind of thing, all right? So my point is that third generation wants to identify. If that's true with other ethnic groups, it's true with whites. Didn't you hear him talk about an election? We want our country back. I wasn't paying attention. I thought it was Native Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want to give all of you a chance to ask your questions. Of, uh, one more, if I may, please. You, uh, you were quoted at one point as saying, the reason you got involved in the civil rights movement in the first place was that you wanted to make things better for your grandmother uh, while she was still alive. Did you uh, succeed? Was she still alive when, uh, when those significant pieces of legislation were passed? No, she died when I was in training in Nashville, 59. But she was aware that I was preparing to get involved and, but my point is, the reason I dropped out of school 
you know, I was a sophomore, and I got involved. I could not wait to finish my degree and all that. I had to do it right then. It's because I was not fighting for my grandchildren. I didn't have any. I was fighting for my grandparents, so at least the years they had left, they would be able to enjoy being treated as a human being and respected with some sense of dignity and not be discriminated against or humiliated. So that's one of the reasons I want. It cannot come fast enough for me. I'm more in tune with that book that Martin Luther King wrote, Why We Can't Wait. It's because we have waited too long, okay? And to say wait means never. So therefore, I could not, okay, uh, hold back. And um, that's when I pushed forward to make this thing happen. And I had the opportunity to work with Dr. King. And that's what I didn't want to miss. Because when I learned from Martin Luther King and walking with him and working with him side by side, there is nothing that can compare uh, to that uh, opportunity and that experience. And for that, I am so grateful. That's why I will go anywhere around the world uh, to teach people uh, Martin Luther King's philosophy and uh, what he stood for. So when they shot him in Memphis, they thought they had killed him. That's why they shot him. Now, he told me he was going to come on to Washington after I got there. Okay? But you see, what happened is they shot him, but they missed. I know they missed because, yeah, they missed because they ended up celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday, a national holiday. No other civilian got a national holiday. And then, not only in the U.S., do you know they celebrate his over 100 some thousand around the world? There's only one person whose birthday is celebrated in more countries than Martin Luther King, and that's J.C. himself. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and and then and then, I looked up, you know, on the mall. He said he was coming to Washington, but I know he's coming like that. A thirty-foot statue <laughs> on the mall, of the United States. Yes, it's a heck of a deal. They put a hit on him. <laughs> But they hit and they missed. Because Martin Luther King is as live today. His message, his story, what you're doing right here, okay? Yes, they missed. I know they missed. Dr. Bernard Lafayette. <laughs> now... If you have uh, questions uh, for Dr. Lafayette, we have a couple of minutes. I'd like to get some of your questions uh, included in the program. So either go either side here. We've got microphones standing by, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, have anybody lined up yet? In the meanwhile, have you seen uh, the butler? Yes. Is it accurate? Yes, the butler is accurate. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Come on down if you've got questions. We've got a few minutes. Uh, we need to keep the microphones down here, but we've got some Peace Study students who volunteered to help, uh, and I'll facilitate. I'll tell you what, uh, since some of you have to leave, I think you don't want to miss this. While we're waiting for uh, 
people with, we got a question over there? Because I think what we should do is entertain them just a little bit. Dr. Lafayette is going to sing for you. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Now, of course, you can, uh, you know, select whatever songs you want, but I want to hear The Buses Are Coming. This is a song that, uh, that you sang in the Parchman State Prison facility in Mississippi, a, a hellhole if ever there was one. Take it away, Dr. Lafayette. <laughs> well, I will be happy to do that. Uh, Let's see. I probably need to stand up, don't I? Well, yeah. if, you, if you want. I'm saying, oh. yeah. <laughs> Take it easy there. Let's see. Does this come out? Yes. <laughs> well, while you're lining up for questions, uh, you know, uh, we have to just uh, be very transparent here. I was studying my New Testament at the American Baptist College when I was a student. And uh, what happened is that uh, I was trying to find me some good, you know, gospel, spiritual music to put me in the mood, you know, to, to read my New Testament. And what happened is I was in Nashville, and I kept turning the radio, and uh, all I could hear was these hillbilly songs. Oh, wait a minute, hold it. I changed the station, and then it said, Oh, do do eat your back up, leaping lizards, crawling crickets. I said, Oh, Lord. <laughs> Turn the thing off. <laughs> so I said to myself, Wait a minute, hold it. I'm hearing this music, but I am not listening. I've been trained to listen. So that's part of the whole nonviolent process. So what happened is I turned the station back on and I started listening. And there was a song, uh, country music, and what happened is it was about a governor, a former governor of uh, Alabama. His name was Jim Folsom. Mm -hmm. They called him Big Jim Folsom. He was a great big old fella. And he was a senator then. And what happened is uh, he, uh, you know, was very much in charge. and. Uh, what happened is he took this little white girl for a ride. A little old young white girl, no more than about 12, 13 years old, in Coleman, Alabama. Nine months later, yeah, she had a little baby and she had to drop out of school and had to take care. This is a little white girl, all right? Sometimes we just think that uh, these people are just don't like black folks. Okay? They don't care about folk. All right? And that's important to, to get through. You know, some, you know, folk need to understand that. They don't care about, you know, don't take it personally. They don't care about anybody other than themselves. They are what you call takers, not givers. And the country uh, musician wrote this song about him. And here's the way it goes. <coughs> She was poor, but she was honest, victim of a rich man's pride. When she met that Christian gentleman, Big Jim Folsom, and she had a child by him. It's the rich who gets the glory. It's the poor who gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Now ain't that a dirty crime shame? Now he sits in the legislature making laws for all mankind while she roams the streets of Coleman, Alabama selling grapes from her grapevine. It's the rich who gets the glory. It's the poor who gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Now ain't that a dirty crying shame? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, music was the thing that really got us going, and music was the thing that kept us going. Because, see, when you have music, and that was one of the things we looked at, to decide where we were going to have a movement. We couldn't go everywhere. Why did we select these different places? Because a lot of them had the same problems. So how do we do that? It's the, when people start singing their own songs, that's when we knew we had a movement because the movement was in them. See, it's one thing to be in the movement. It's another thing to have movement in you. Okay? So uh, that's the one thing we always looked at. And so I'm going to sing this very quickly, or just two verses, and then we're going to get some questions. Okay? So one of the things that happened is that we uh, sang throughout the movement in the jail and every place else. All right? So uh, uh, Jerry wants me to sing this song right here. I sang it, and then we'll, at the end, anybody going to stay over, you know, to 12 o'clock, we'll sing again. All right. <laughs> uh, we wanted to let the jailers know that we were not the only Freedom Riders, that some others were coming. So we used to sing uh, in jail. And this song we sang, like some of you saw on the uh, film, okay? Buses are a-coming, oh yes. Buses are a-coming, oh yes. Buses are a-coming, buses are a-coming, buses are a-coming, oh yes. To in the city jail, actually, and so we could look out and we could see the route of the buses coming to the bus station, okay? Because we were up there on the third floor, and we could look out the window, and we saw around and saw the jailer, and we say, better get you ready, oh yes. Better get you ready, oh yes. Better get you ready, better get you ready, better get you ready. Oh, yes, they're coming into Jackson. Oh, yes, they're coming into Jackson. Oh, yes, they're coming into Jackson. Coming into Jackson. Coming into Jackson. Oh, yes, loaded with those Freedom Riders. Oh, yes, loaded with those Freedom Riders. Oh, yes. Loaded with those freedom riders, loaded with those freedom riders, loaded with those freedom riders, oh yes. Okay. I kind of want to listen to this song, right? But we did promise you a chance to ask some questions. So we'll start over here and go back and forth a couple of times. Um. Thank you, Dr. Lafayette, for gracing us with your presence today. I really enjoyed your uh, insights into the civil rights movement and your experience. Um, and I think your first song kind of just set it up for this question. Uh, but um, my question is that we live in a radically new generation where um, we are actually a part of a very big uh, corporate economy. And I feel like uh, institutional racism is as much economic as it is historical. So I would like to know what your thoughts about how to um, overcome this and achieve more equality in the face of uh, gross inequality. Thank you. Very good. That's going to take about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> the short of it is that um, no change can come unless you deal with change. Money. Okay? That's the change that has to come. All right, we have to change how we distribute, okay, and invest money. Money actually is a substitute for human beings. 
That's why we always talk about how much are you worth. Uh, uh, okay. What do you think they talk about when they say you're worth? You worth? They don't ask you how much is your money worth. So you see the problem is that people have substituted these external commodities, okay, uh, uh, for their own persons. They, 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 they uh, have to then sort of understand that it's not how many bonds you have in your uh, investments, it's how much have you invested in bonding with each other. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, bonding is what we're talking about. Your relationship and how you treat other people, all right, et cetera. Like, for example, in Haiti, they have all these people on the street selling stuff, and then you just walk down half a block and the people selling the same thing. And you just walk right down, you know, and about the same price, okay. Guess what they do at the end of the day? They check with each other to see who had some sales. If somebody had been sitting there all day in the sun, and didn't make a sale, guess what? The ones who made the sale would go and buy their stuff. So everybody <laughs> made some sales. So you got to worry about not how much you were able to sell, but you got to be concerned about how did the sales go. Okay? So yes, the economics, that's the problem. We don't look at it in terms of all of us because we don't look at our own worth and value. The only worth we have, or wealth we have, is what we can be to others. You know what I mean? How many people need you? That's why you're in school, by the way, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> you're in school so you can have something to give other people. That enhances your value. That's why you're in school? Yeah, I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> it ain't how, much, how, much, how much in your bank account is how much can you be accountable for? How many children out there who need your education? All right? Yeah, you don't have time to be fooling around. You got these folk coming behind you. These children got to be out there teaching them how to, okay, become better citizens. In fact, you need to organize in the whole state of, uh, what state are we in? Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota? I think so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you need to have a youth legislature from 12 to 17 years old. So you can start teaching them how to elect officials. They can have their own legislature and elect officials. They can read some bills and pass some laws and stuff like that. A youth legislature. So by the time they turn 18, they already got some practice. They know what to look for in terms of character in the folks that they elect. Citizenship education is like driver's education. All right? You're going to wreck things and tear things up and kill yourself if you don't have any driver's education. Exactly what you're doing with voter registration. All right? So my point is economics, yes. We got to make sure that the people who are voting on our money is making sure that it's distributed and it's helpful to all of us. Why are they going to take our money? We retired. Okay? You guess what they do with it? You know what they do with our money? You ever heard of a place called uh, uh, Red Wing? Is it Red Wing, Minnesota? Yes, sir. You know what's in Red Wing? The juvenile facility, which you haven't been to. And 90% of them are non-white. That's what they're doing with your money. They done stole it and then put up juvenile facilities. And keeping them people from registering to vote and charging them with felonies and all that. You better go get your money. All right? That's what I'm talking about. So, the economic development means that you have to have 
people understanding how to use these resources and how to use themselves. Uh, short of it is that when I was seven years old, I used to run my own business, age seven. I used to be Mr. Coffee. I would go to the businesses. I was in business now. So I would go to the businesses that open up. I'd jump out of bed at 530, and I was over there in the business community uh, helping the merchants. When they open up their shops, I was there taking orders for coffee. I lived in Ybor City, all right, Tampa, Florida. So what I did was uh, went to the uh, Las Novedadas and ordered coffee, and I would take it back to the merchants. I was Mr. Coffee before I went to school every morning. What you have to do is look at a need that people have, and if you fulfill that need, you're never going to be needy. So that's what we need to teach our young people. All right. I had three jobs when I was in graduate school at Harvard University. Okay. I went and interviewed and got accepted. Two weeks later, they made me the assistant dean of admissions. <laughs> That's right. You, you, can sh you can check the record, okay? <laughs> All right. Then I set up Middlesex Community College, an evening college for people who were working downtown. That's where I had the college, downtown, where folks can walk from their work to the college. I was assistant deputy director, Center for Urban Studies. I was a teaching fellow. Okay, all right, at Harvard University. So my point is, I've never been without three jobs. <laughs> so don't tell me there's no work involved. Create some. All right, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hate to say this, but we're already running over time. Yeah, I know. Um, that's what happened. Can we take one more question? That there are people. Why don't we just ask all the questions and then I can respond one time. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I got the answer. I'm telling you what the question is. <laughs> okay, if you make your questions really brief. <laughs> Over here. Is this on? Uh, doctor, there's the argument that the U.S. government was behind the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. We don't read much about it in the press. And I'm wondering, I, I'd like to hear your comments on that subject. Okay, next question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where was the movement going in 68? Was there a shift with the Poor People's Campaign to more class-based organizing? And uh, was there more involvement in the anti-war movement? Good question. My question is about the uh, third generation syndrome and how that affects people with um, narratives that haven't really been established, such as those uh, of mixed race. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's hold right here, and let me respond to those very quickly, okay? I have not investigated Martin Luther King's death in terms of who killed him. I can tell you right now, James Earl Ray did not. And I, can, I have evidence that he did not because he was not left-handed. I went to the, uh, the, the room where the fire, the shot was supposed to have been fired to kill Martin Luther King, and there's a bathtub right across the window, okay? And I went there with a homicide detective, and this homicide detective put himself in the position so he could look out the window with the bathtub right there. He said the only way that the, uh, James Earl Ray could have uh, got an angle to kill Martin Luther King was if he had to be left-handed. I was at, uh, over at the uh, University of Rhode Island. On the staff over there is the man who did the forensic test on the gun that James Earl Ray used. And he came out with the same conclusion that that was not uh, uh, verifiable, that that gun was the one that killed Martin Luther King. Okay. Now, I haven't done any research, and I haven't, because I've been too busy trying to make sure that what he wanted to do in terms of institutionalizing nonviolence would go on. But from the evidence I got, Dexter King, Martin Luther King's youngest son, met with James Earl Ray and asked him, did you kill my father? 
looked him straight in the eye and said, no, I did not kill your father. And Dexter believed that because he's king, okay? She believed the same thing. Every member of the family believed that happened. So all Martin Luther King's x-rays and all the evidence and everything in the forensic was sealed up by a presidential order for 50 years. So we got to wait. Okay? And we can find out who killed Kennedy 50 years after. All right? In fact, there's a magazine out. All right? On the front page of that magazine, it says how Kennedy was killed. All right? So that's my response. It's not an answer. It's just a response. Okay? Uh, the next, in terms of the things changed when Martin Luther, uh, 1968, Martin Luther King was on the Poor People's Campaign and the war in Vietnam and that sort of thing, etc. Yes, there was a shift because you see, we could not get any headlines as long as the war was going on. And Martin Luther King understood that we had to end the war in order to deal with the domestic issues of poverty and the international issues, okay? So we had to go to the international issue of war in order to stop and move to these other areas. So the point is, there is a relationship between poverty and war, because this was the draft. And who do you think was draft to go to Vietnam? And who died in record numbers in combat? Poor people, black, Native Americans, Hispanics, and that sort of thing. I got a lot of stories about that. I did go to Vietnam as a research project, okay? Bishop Paul Moore out of New York took a delegation and I went with them and investigated the repression against the uh, monks and the Buddhist monks and also the uh, students who were involved in the peace movement. So I do have information on that and we'll share it uh, now. The next question was? Third generation. Third generation. Yes. People might have mixed uh, cultures and that sort of thing, but there's usually one that's predominant. And in many cases, it's the mama, okay, who raises the little boy and can stay with them, that kind of thing. And, and that family, whatever, okay? Uh, so therefore, that third generation has already uh, identified itself in terms of the uh, particular things in their culture that they like their religion and other things that they you know embrace. So uh, when they relieve themselves of that and join the dominant, okay, whichever culture they embrace, if they join and try to absorb themselves, or if it's more than one culture and they want to you know discard it, because sometimes people have parents who one born in one country and one born in the other, all right? All right, like my grandfather was born in Cuba. His father was French, okay? And it, his mother was, was uh, Cuban, all right? And then West Indians, you know, my grandfather married West Indians. So I, I, I like pigeon peas and rice and black eyed peas and rice too, <laughs> as well as black bean soup. <laughs> Now you want to get me, give me some uh, guy bouncers, you know, some chickpeas, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my point is, uh, yes, even with the mixed culture, there is a predominant one, okay. And when they release that and for the, for the uh, majority culture, dominant culture uh, in another country, that's the uh, second generation. Now, when I go back to my roots, I have to go back to Africa, France, okay, Bahamas, Cuba, all right? So, uh, we can talk about that some more later. Let's, let's get some more questions and then we can close. The rest? All right, we, we do have to wrap up after this one, so one more. All right, yeah. uh, hi, Dr. Bernard. Um, my name is Ashley Yang, I think, for our last question, thank you, um, is I think, now that we live in this society, there are a lot of underrepresented groups that we're, that we're noticing. And um, in terms of equality and equity, what does it mean to you to be an ally for, 
so that maybe a lot of us who are here can be called to action, who have, like, you know, because many of us are differently called to action in different times of our life. So what does it mean to you to be an ally, and what can we do? An ally? Oh, first of all, we have to identify ourselves differently because when we uh, see people with specific problems, we have to not see ourselves as simple allies. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We have to see ourselves as human beings also because, number one, we could have been born in that same situation. No one here uh, did any research and decided that they wanted to be a, a white person <laughs> when they were born, you know, or an Ethiopian, okay, or whatever. And you didn't decide you were going to be born in, uh, you know, Minnesota. You could have been born in uh, South Carolina, okay, or Mississippi or someplace. We just showed up. Now, we don't have any small children here, but we all know how you got here. It's no secret. We know how you got into the world. I'm looking at you. You may be all dressed up. And all this, but I, I know how you got here. <laughs> In fact, you didn't even have on any clothes when you got here. You know? <laughs> okay? So my point is, let's get down to earth. All right? And we ain't no better than anybody else. You ain't getting to, to in the world through the back door. You, everybody came through the front door. Okay? So we're all here. Now the question is, let's, sh let's, let's sort of share this sort of false identity that we have, okay? And, and all these names and stuff like that. People get too hung up on that. What are you? The question is, who are you? That's what it is. No, what are you? Who are you? All right? And then when you could say, I am somebody. And you are somebody. And we are involved in somebody-ness. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're going to do, okay? So once we overcome that, that's one of the things I was dealing with earlier, then we can decide, okay, what is it that we can offer the world? You've got to find your best contribution to the world. Otherwise, why did you come in the first place? <laughs> Just to eat up all the... the uh, hamburgers you can and all the steak and, and, and drive a fancy car and all that kind of stuff, etc. And then you get your slow ride. I don't care how much you speed and how much kind of, you're going to get a slow ride to the cemetery. <laughs> they ain't going to run no traffic lights except the police lead them through it, okay? So we ain't got time. We, we got to, you know, get busy and uh, we got to go because the light's on. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bernard Lafayette. freedom in the air there must be a God somewhere Is that enough I think we can live with that okay uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>